when I think of Peter Lynch, I, I think of Chrysler, I think of Dunkin' Donuts, and I was telling a friend that we were reading this book, and the first thing they said was, okay, look around you, buy the stocks that you know, and you're better than Wall Street because you can look around you. The amateur edge, that's what he's known for, I would say, uh, mostly, like that's the thing he's most known for, that message. Um, why don't you explain for the audience what that amateur edge message is, and then I'd love to get your thoughts on like, if you practice that. So the amateur edge would be kind of that the, basically, I think he explains it more so like he explains what the institutions have and what are the restrictions that they have to abide by. Kind of like you can't have more than 5% of your overall portfolio in a single stock, right? For an amateur, no one's telling you, like there's no one over looking over your shoulder and telling you, you can't get into X, Y, Z stock, you know, at more than this percentage and you can't yeah. let it run up. When it hits like 2x, you have to sell it. So that's kind of what he's talking about, where the amateur has a lot of benefits that the institutional investor might not have. An institutional investor has to report to shareholders. An amateur investor has to report to no one, right? It's all their own money. It's their wins, their losses. The profit is theirs, the loss is also theirs. For an institutional investor, they have to kind of report every quarter. This is what I've done. This is how the portfolio has changed. This is how I'm going to justify my salary. The amateur doesn't have to worry about all that. So there's a lot less pressure on the amateur. And that's kind of what he gets into in the first little bit of this book. Yeah, and we, we can also invest in anything we want. And we can invest in companies that we see around us, companies that we find ourselves using. And we don't have to wait until those stocks become well-known businesses and well-known companies that get... Uh, institutional coverage and have analysts from all the Wall Street banks and uh, institutions covering them, uh, we can get into those businesses earlier. Um, one thing I found myself asking myself uh, when I was reading about that is, is he talks about all the stories of like, he, he so-and-so sees this company before they get big and, and buys it. And then he talks about the story of the the legging product, uh, legs or eggs or whatever they're called, uh, that Hanes the bought. Or I found, yeah. <laughs> yeah, at the grocery store. And it had me questioning, like, where are all these public companies? Because ever since I read this book and as I've been an investor, I'm not perfect at it. Nobody is. Like, we we all miss things around us. Like, we'll, we'll be a customer mm -hmm. of a business. We'll love a company. And we won't even think, is this a public company? Or we'll go visit a place, like he talks about a, a golf course, and we won't ask ourselves, is this a public company hidden asset or something like that? So it's very easy to forget to do this, but I try really hard to remember to always ask myself, like, is this a public company? But despite that, I don't, I don't find myself answering like, yes, a lot. Like, oftentimes, it's either a big business that everybody already knows about, or it's a company that's private. And I just think like the world has changed a lot in these 30 years. And I think the number of public companies in the US is like down by half because a lot of uh, private buyouts and a lot of uh, mergers and acquisitions, it's just a different um, setup. I'm not saying there are no small caps that are undiscovered or you can't look around and see a, uh, a business out there that's public and uh, people just don't know about it yet and it's got a long runway. But I definitely think to some extent the economy has changed, um, especially in like retail. Um, it just seems to be a lot more bigger businesses and fewer of them, or the businesses are a lot bigger and there's fewer of them. So one thing I wanted to bring up to you is like, maybe uh, this is all still going on in terms of like, you can find these businesses before everybody knows about them, but maybe a lot of it is more like digital and it's more like apps and e-commerce and uh, things like that. Uh, and so something that came to mind for me is like coupon or coupon. Um, obviously institutions know about it, but not a lot of like international retail investors. And it's a business that people use every day in Korea and it's, it's growing, but it's just not talked about a lot. Like I don't think it's in a value line and um, I just don't see it talked a lot about. So, uh, you know, I'm kind of like, I look around, I don't see too many of those restaurants or retail businesses that no one knows about yet that are public. Uh, but there's maybe different parts of the economy where that's going on. So what, what do you what do you think about that? What's, are you looking what's around? Kind of like the smallest company that you've looked at? Like, I mean, are we talking like sub 1 billion or sub 500 million? Or, okay. Well, I mean, this book made me question myself because like, 
I look at my portfolio, I have Alphabet and Amazon in there, and I really right. like that I do. And it made me question myself, like maybe I'm looking at large cap too much and I'm not taking advantage of being an individual investor enough. But I don't know if that's just a hang up I have because I have been in Ring Energy. That's like a right, exactly. $400 million market cap. And it's been a lot smarter than that. I have been in Pedevco that's under $100 million. Um, and then I am in Racist, which is just a, it, it's been a 100 to $200 million market cap. And it's just a different uh, kind of out of the way stock um, compared to a lot of the US. So maybe I am doing this. I think where I'm just having trouble uh, with this concept is like he talks a lot about restaurants and a lot about retail. And it, it just seems like the restaurants have totally changed. There's not too many. I don't think there's a, I, I know there are some public ones that are smaller, but I look at them and I'm like, I mean, you compare Cheesecake Factory to like back then versus now, they're very different companies. Like, <laughs> Exactly. I don't know if actually, was a thing back then, but I think so, probably. And, and then I'll give you an example that's very near and dear to my heart and to my stomach is Kane's Chicken. Like Kane's Chicken would be a perfect Peter Lynch stock. Like I know how awesome it is. I know how different their business model is. There's something magical about that place because not only the food, but like when you think of fast food employees, the first word that comes to mind is not usually happiness, but there's something that they've done at Kane's Chicken where you go through the drive through and the employees are always in a good mood and, and happy. So nice. and part of that is probably because the uh, restaurant is run in such a simple way because they just offer the same thing over and over. Um, and that's part of their business strategy. But that's a business that is not in a lot of parts of the country yet, I think. It's been rapidly expanding. Guess what? It's not public because that the world's a little different these days um, and right. there's just less uh, public companies. So um I guess I'm just wondering if, if this is a thing in different um, different parts of the economy. But I still think it's a good concept to look at your credit card bill, see where you're spending your money, and never forget to ask yourself, is this a public company? Even if it's not intuitive, like if you're at an airport in Turkey uh, with uh, <laughs> Tav Airports, that's something I would have never thought of before Mona started talking about Tav. Is the airport public? I just don't think that way in the United States. Or if you're at a golf course, is this a hit, hidden uh, asset play. So always be asking yourself, is this a public company? Yeah. And I think that thing that you mentioned about the economy changing over the last 30 years, so true. Like you've seen just businesses get larger, start like Peter Lynn says, diversifying, you know, acquiring random businesses here and there. You've seen a lot of that, especially over the last 10 years or so, where it's been like 0% rates, right? So everyone's like, okay, if I even own like a 5 6% rate of return on this business, worth it because my borrowing costs are zero. So let me just try to clump as many small divisions I can and, you know, have a high revenue business that doesn't make a lot of money, but it's okay because rates are so low. Well, and then the whole um, Berkshire Hathaway and Warren Buffett having a lot more competition in terms of buyers of, of businesses in the private space, the private equity industry since 1990, I think has just like totally boomed. And as interest rates had been lowered, those guys can borrow a ton of money, uh, pay high prices and take these businesses out of the public stock market. So um, it's definitely a different market. But as we'll talk about like later in the episode, we are investors. That's what we do. And we're not here to make excuses. We're here to find, OK, there used to be 5000 stocks in the US. Now there's 2500, whatever. I'll find the five best of the 2500 and we'll we'll make it happen. But that's.